Welcome to the MMA Happy Hour. I am Kyle Anthony, your host. We're here. We have interviews, MMA banter, and betting advice. This week, UFC Vegas 74, Amir Albazi versus Kai Kara France. We're going to talk three plays on the show today. So excited about breaking it down. We had a week off. We did. We had the week off. It was nice. It was relaxing. Got to the beach, went to Atlantic City, had some fun. But we're back to business. We coming off, we're actually coming off last week. We ended up cashing in for nine units. The week after a uh, week prior to that, we cashed in for over five units. So we're looking good here. 14 units over the last two weekends. Nice, but we gotta keep it going. Excited about it this weekend. Have a four percent best bet play up at wagertalk.com. Check it out. If you're also interested, link down in the description. And um, next week, UFC 289. Excited about that one now again. I'm attempting, I've been talking to Johnny Walker, I'm attempting to get him back on the show for our Wednesday show here on MMA Happy Hour, so hopefully we can get him in, he said yes, hopefully scheduling all works out, and we'll get him on, so uh, definitely excited about that, and um, I think that's it, I think it's time to jump into the first play, which is going to be the main event of the evening between Kai Kara France versus Amir Albazi. You've got Kara France and Albazi at a pick em price here. Um, you know, pretty much kind of teetering around this line right now, give or take uh, a couple cents between these guys. But um, this one here, I think is extremely, extremely interesting. Just the way that this is all kind of playing out, where the line sits. And I think the first thing we're looking at is what what's the path here? And obviously we all know Amir Albazi is going to look for the control time, the wrestling, getting that top pressure and keeping the fight there and grinding it out. And the other side here, you know, Kai Kara France, you know, slick boxing, good footwork, has some power. But the big question here obviously is going to be is, can Amir Albazi get Kai Kara France to the floor? That's going to be the issue. That's going to be the big question. And we're going to probably know that pretty quickly in that first round. I think we'll be able to tell, is he getting these takedowns or is Kai Kara France doing his thing? And, you know, when he gets those takedowns, there is opportunity where Albazi has looked good. He can get that control time and all those things are great. You know, since he's entered the UFC, um, 13 takedown attempts, six he was successful on. So there are there is that. He has done some good things, but there is a lot against him in this spot when you're looking at it. And I think the first thing here is the fact that Kai Kara France is extremely versed in takedown defense. I really like what I have seen from all of his fights and just continually getting better when it comes to his takedown defense. I like what he does with his hips. He really sprawls very well. He scrambles very well. He's very, very, I would say maybe active. As soon as someone latches on, he's quickly working the hands. He's hand fighting. He's getting position. He's never just taking the position and saying, all right, I'm taken down. Let me, let, let me kind of figure this out. Or even if he's up against the fence, let me figure this out instantly right away. He's positionally doing the right thing, pushing his opponent. Um, his opponent's up on his back. He's trying to scrape him off his back. He's hand fighting, pulling the hand down, doing all these great things. And I think that's really going to be difficult for Emil Bazi, who that that's his path. That's where he's looking for. He's going to keep looking for the uh, looking for these takedowns, looking for that control time. And if he keeps fighting it, and if he keeps kind of doing those kinds of things, it's going to be very difficult for him. Also, the fact that I love that Kai Kara France has a lot of fakes, a lot of feints, and a lot of times for me that really just draws out these these actions against opponents. And every time I see it, 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 it just makes them a little, little iffy on that, on that shot, on that takedown. And so much Kai Kara France has added that to his game. I think that's going to be very difficult in certain spots for Albazi to cut that distance, to look to get the, to, to look to get his hands on him. And that's going to be very, very hard. Again, that we've seen it against um, Askar Askarov. Very recently, Kai Kara France looked great. He, uh, Askarov had 14 takedown attempts and was successful on two of them, which says a lot. I really rate, um, you know, uh, Askarov pretty high in his wrestling, and he's showing that it still is there when it comes to that takedown defense. And overall, Kai Kara France has an 87% takedown defense rate. I think it's going to be tested, but it shows he is extraordinarily good when it comes to staying on his feet and keeping it there. And also the fact that if this fight stays standing, I think Kai Kara France goes out there and picks him apart from beginning to the end. I don't really see that there's much else that's going to be happening if he doesn't get these takedowns, doesn't get that control time. I think he picks him picks him apart pretty easily. Also, Abazi, you know, he's he struggles with with striking defense. You know, he's so one, I guess, 
tunnel vision is probably the better word on these takedowns that he doesn't really, you know, I, I'm not really impressed at all with his striking and he's hittable. He's lackluster in his, in his defensive striking and, uh, and guys with much less striking than Kai Kara France have been landing on him. Yes. He's winning. Yes. There's some of these things I'm going to talk about in a minute about their, their strength of schedule, but you know, there's definitely guys that you wouldn't think should be clipping him are clipping him. And I think Kara France really, really has the opportunity to land some big shots when Albazi is getting desperate with some of these takedowns, can't get the fight to the ground. That's where I think it opens up some nice shots for Kai Kara France in this spot here. And again, now the competition level is going to highly favor Kai Kara France in this spot here. And if you look at, look at it, the first thing is, is he's just coming off a fight against Brandon Moreno for the title uh, that, you know, in a fight where if you rewatch it, Kai Kara France looked really good up until that that body kick. I mean, I thought he was, you know, you know, defending takedowns well, scrambling well, working to space well, um, landing good shots, countering on Moreno. And I obviously we all are. I mean, pretty damn high on Brandon Moreno and his durability, all of these things, just massive amounts of weapons that Brandon has. And I thought Kai Kara France fought really well, lost, but fought really well. And you even look at it, you know, we faced Brandon Royval. He ended up beating Cody Garbrandt, um, beating uh, Rogerio Bontarine, beating Askar Asparov, who I would actually say is a better version of Amir Albazi. And he went out there and got the victory. So this is a big step up for uh, uh, Albazi, absolutely the toughest fight that he has ever faced. While on the other side, this is a little bit of a downgrade from many of the fighters, or probably a lot of a downgrade, of many of the fighters that Kai Kara France fought. And even if you're looking at it also, the four, uh, he's 16-1, and Albazi, 4-0 in the UFC. Now, the four wins are against Malcolm Gordon, who's 2-4 and four in the UFC. Uh, Zalgis Zimagulov, the legend, who's one in five uh, in the UFC. Um, then you have uh, Francisco Figueredo, who is the less successful brother of Davison Figueredo, and I am not high on him at all, uh, uh, high on Francisco, and he ended up beating him. And then most recently, uh, Albazi beat a UFC debuting fighter. So I, I, I'm, I'm, there's so many questions to be to be to to hopefully get answered here on Albazi, but what we see right now. I think there's a lot of holes in this game. I think that there's opportunity and a path here for Kai Kara France. I think he can really beat him. If this fight stays standing, which I, I think it really will, um, I think Kai Kara France does what he wants on the feet. And if you're talking about a pick em price at this with a guy who really has, has all the tools, has faced far better caliber fighters where Albazi absolutely needs takedowns and that's going to be his only path to victory. I like Kai Kara France here and I think he goes out, gets the job done. I think he has all the ability to even get that finish, but I'm taking Kai Kara France to get the job done. All right. So now we're other one here. We're going to talk about is going to be Maxim Grisham versus Philip Linz. Now, uh, we got uh, Grisham. He's minus 146. And the comeback here, Philip Linz, plus 114. And so this is the first fight of the night when we're looking at this. Hold on, let me see if I can. There we go. Just trying <laughs> Move my camera a little bit. This is the first fight of the night. Now, you got Max Grisham. He's a grinder. He's a veteran. There's, you know, he, he can strike, but pretty much he can grind you out. And that has been his path to victory. On the other side here, Philip Linz is one of those guys that, you know, went was in PFL, looked good, knocking guys out, all these great things, wins the championship, wins a million dollars, and then gets popped for PEDs. And boy, he has not looked the same. Comes to the UFC, um, Fights uh, Andre Arlovsky, loses an easy decision, and then fought uh, Tanner Bozer, got brutally knocked out in the first round. And then he comes now, he moves down a division, and he's now, and then he fought um, Marcin uh, Practio uh, and uh, OSP, very bottom level guys, OSP in his 40s. I mean, so, so, you know, that being said, he ended up getting those victories, but still two and two and was just popped not long ago on PEDs. Um, now, I think that the, the thing here is Linz, I think, thinks that th that his speed and his power is going to be a big advantage for him here. I think that's really where it's going to be uh, a spot for him to possibly have some success. But when you're looking at this overall, 
you know, I think the biggest issue, and I think it's probably a lot of people going to talk about this, is the biggest issue is Philip Lynch just doesn't have cardio. You know, he does not have the ability to support these big shots, these big swings, these big hooks over and over again over a lengthy period of time. And not even really lengthy because he dies off after the first round. I mean, after that first round, he really dies off. He doesn't have that, that the big pop in his hands. The, the output goes down. The power looks to go down. And that's not something you can do you can't really just dive off in the UFC. Now, Grisham, definitely of an older guy. You know, he, he's, he's definitely not, not any world beater by any means. But, you know, I just think there's a path for him. And, and if you're looking at Phil Blinch, who is going to throw the big shots early or at least possibly throw these big shots early and, and, and tick down in his cardio, Maxim Grisham loves to grind you out. And his path and in the style at which Grisham fights – should line up pretty well to just kind of smother Linz. We're going to be in the apex cage. I think that Linz has limited just ability, limited knowledge when it comes to grappling, um, anything when it comes to the wrestling in the clinch. I don't really put it, you know, very basic stuff. Where, where I do like Christian. I think Christian can grind it on him. Can will be the physically stronger guy. I think he'll have the the size advantage too. And these are some of the things I think he could use when he's grinded on him. When he's kind of just keeping him up against the fence. That's going to be opportunity to. To not only just maybe have an opportunity to win, but win those rounds. And I think that's going to be very important, especially early in that fight where Linz could be going and, and, and throwing those big bombs um, and looking to land. But on the other side of it is the fact that, you know, Grisham, you know, he can fuel these takedowns. He can go, he can fuel them, he can keep going. And also the fact that he's just very durable. So he's a guy that, you know, could Lynn, and listen, this is, this is, you know, the big boys throw and, you know, anyone can get knocked out, but he is historically pretty durable. If you look at Grisham, uh, you know, Grisham, you know, uh, what, what was it here? Um, last time he was knocked out was 2016 against Magomed Ankalaev. Now, Ankalaev, we know what he is. He is up there. He is a top-level fighter, you know, elite when it comes to his striking, and he knocks him out. That was back in 2016. Prior to that, the, the, the next time, or, or the time before that, that Grisham was knocked out was back in 2011. So he's a guy that can absorb shots, can take these shots. I think he has a good path here to, you know, kind of get through that first round, you know, take the shots, but then grind on them and grind on them and win the rounds. And now both of these guys are, 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 are no spring chickens either. You've got Grisham. He's 39. But on the other side here, you got Linz. He's I think 37, 36, 37 years old. So he is not a guy that's going to be this young guy either that has all these, you know, he's growing into the UFC. Not at all. So it's a spot where if he, if they both kind of dive off in their cardio, I think that Grisham's style will work well in the apex cage because if they both kind of gas out, I think it's going to be sloppy. He's going to lean on him a little bit, but I think his skill set overall is better than Lynn's even at this point in their career. So I do like Maxim, Gr Maxim Grishin to win minus 146. All right. Now the last one we're going to be talking about here is going to be Jared Gordon versus Jim Miller. Now you got Jared Gordon minus 200 on the comeback here for Jim Miller plus 145. Now, when you're looking at this fight here, I think the first thing that everybody's going to be talking about is going to be, um, is going to be the fact that just recently Jared Gordon was brutally knocked out. Now, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, but um, uh, about a month ago, Yes, you heard me a month ago. Um, Jared Gordon was uh, had fought Bobby Green, had a there was a headbutt, ended up dropping uh, Gordon, and then Bobby Green lands some brutal, I mean brutal ground and pound, lands some good shots, puts him out cold, knocks out Jared Gordon, and then it becomes a no contest and all these other things. But either way, no contest or not, he was brutally knocked out about five weeks ago. And that, to me, definitely says something when you're looking at this fight, when you're looking at a guy who has been hit, who can be hit, who has been rocked and wobbled and certain things like that. This is a quick turnaround. This is a very quick turnaround for this guy in a spot where, you know, you think he'd want some time. Not, you, know, you know, you got rocked two times uh, in one fight, you know, headbutt and then being act you know, actually knocked out. Those are some brutal shots that you're taking very, very recently. So that's part of it. But on the other side of it, a lot of people, you know, are starting to say, hey, well, maybe, maybe Jim Miller is going to knock him out. You know, Jim Miller's got power. And I've heard, you know, people saying Jim Miller has power. And I, I don't, I think that's 
way overrated when you're talking about that. You know, Jim Miller, yes, you know, he he's dropped some guys. He's maybe knocked some guys out recently, but, you know, he's knocked out some, some lower-level guys. But when you're looking at his career, he's got 35 wins. He's got six knockout victories. Six. Not not 26. He's got six knockouts. So it's not like he's out there sparking guys out. It's not that that's going to be even his path to victory. It's, that's not his path. He's not going to go out there and just stand and bang with, with Jared Gordon. I don't think that's really what's going to happen. And I think that Jared Gordon is, is he knows that he was knocked out recently. So I think he's going to look to kind of wrestle more than maybe stand and bang um, uh, in that particular spot. So I, I don't really think that's going to be an issue. I don't think that Jared Gordon's going to have any worry of kind of moving forward really with, with the power that, uh, that Jim Miller does have. And this is a spot where I think it's going to be a lot of grappling. I think it's going to be a lot of clinching, a lot of wrestling. I think both of these guys are looking for that. We're again, we're in the apex cage. I think it's going to present some opportunities for both these guys to wrestle, grapple, get into the clinch. Plus, both of them have good cardio. So it's not that one guy is going to, you know, they're going to wrestle, 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 and someone's going to die out and maybe find that finish. I think it's the other way. I think, I think, both of them can be protected. Both of them are very high, uh, you know, you know, high level grapplers. They have the ability to, you know, to finish, but I don't think they have the ability to finish each other. I, I don't really see it. I think that they're both going to be able to play it safe in certain spots. If they're on the ground, they're both knowledgeable. I think that's going to be able to play it too. The cardio will allow them to keep fighting, to keep going on in this. Um, and I think also when you're looking at this, so I, I do lean towards the, the Jared Gordon side. I do lean towards him getting the victory, but at this price, minus two, I don't like it um, at all here. And also there's some questions on Jim Miller's side. So that may kind of give me, you know, the heebie-jeebies on taking him. So when I'm looking at this spot here, I'm looking at the over. I'm looking at over two and a half minus 150, I think is a pretty damn good spot when you're looking at this. I mean, you know, again, I do think that Jared Gordon has the ability to get the, get the victory. But if you're looking at Jim Miller, he's no, he's very tough to finish. And he's got 17 losses, 12 are by decision. Two by knockout, three by submission. I don't see Jared Gordon knocking him out. I don't see Jared Gordon submitting him. I think this is going to be grinded out, very close rounds, and just grappling kind of side of things. And other side, Jared Gordon, he's no finisher. He's got 19 victories, uh, 11 are by decision. So he's also another guy that I don't think can get the finish on um uh, on Jim Miller. So this is a spot I do like the over. Over two and a half, minus 150, I think is a good spot. Makes sense to me. And again, I, I, I don't mind if anyone's trying to take that Jim Miller plus money. I, I thought about it, but here I think that anybody can, I think this, this, this fight could be close, but I like the over. I like both of them surviving, grappling it out. So I like the over two and a half, minus 150. So there you have it. There is the MMA happy hour for this week. If you want to become a client, link down in the description. Hopefully next week we've got Johnny Walker on the show talking UFC 289. Excited about it. Um, but right now I've got three plays up for clients. We'll probably have four, maybe five plays this weekend. If you want to become a client, link down in the description. Also at wagertalk.com, Kyle Anthony, you'll find me there. And on Twitter at Kyle Anthony UFC. And um, let's see how we do. Let's get it done and let's cash.